no matter where you are, what your position, always try to push the boundary. Push the boundary, even only one inch. She successfully steered her country through the financial crisis and is known as a tough reformer of Southeast Asia's largest economy. Indonesian Finance Minister Sri Mulyani. Forbes has repeatedly included her in the list of the most powerful women in the world. An economist, a mother of three, and a role model. How did Sri Mulyani come to power in a largely conservative society? How is she using her position to empower women in Indonesia? And what role can men play in the fight for equality? Let's find out. Minister Sri Mulyani, thank you for joining our series, Mercas Era, the Women of Power. You are a woman of power as Indonesia's first era female finance minister. How does it feel to be a pioneer? The challenge for a woman in any position, especially if that position is the first time in the history, then uh, the women usually have a more burden, we call it double burden or triple burden, to prove it that you were able to hold that position with competence, with the ability to deliver the responsibility. I think that is very typical for many women. Usually the male counterpart will not be asked that kind of question. It is considered as natural for them to hold the office, but for women, you really have to prove it. Isn't it frustrating sometimes for you? How did you manage to, to overcome these obstacles? I'm fully aware that this is going to happen because I come from my family background in which my my mother was also a pioneer. She was the first to take the PhD degree in education. So she always said, the world is not fair for a woman. As a woman, you have to really like prove it that you are smarter than others. I was prepared to face this kind of situation. It's not frustrating, it's more like even the motivation to show that we, we deserve, we are able to do that. During her first tenure, Mulyani tackled corruption and managed to reduce Indonesia's public debt. As a result of these reforms, by 2010, the country recorded its highest annual economic growth since 1997, a success that hit the headlines. In 2010, Sri Mulyani moved to the U.S. to work at the World Bank as its managing director. She used her platform at the International Financial Institution to promote gender equality. Mulyani returned to Indonesia in 2016 for a second term as finance minister. She continues to support women, believing that education is key in achieving gender equality. When the parents have only one opportunity, they will pick the boys first. Uh, to go to school rather than the girls. And that is really the challenge. So we try to use this budget, uh, especially in designing the social protection, providing equal opportunity, whether this is education. Girls across Indonesia, especially those living in rural areas throughout its many islands, can benefit from this support. They repeatedly confront hurdles in their lives and have to swim upstream. Usually girls, uh, they perform well academically. But then, if you have in a higher education, there is a problem of the dropout. There is still a problem in part of Indonesia, like the child marriage, because the girls, especially in a rural area, when you are in a late teenager, they were asked why you're not married yet. Uh, if they have an education high enough, they, they will be told that, oh, you are scaring boy because you are not in the position that the boy feel comfortable to have a woman which is smarter than you are and so on. So these are all the social norm values. You have to perform according to the perception of the other gender or the society, which is restricting you. You really have to take much more deeper on the social construction, social value, sometimes cultural or even religious in this case. You've maybe heard of the gender gap. The term describes disparities between men and women in different areas. For example, the lack of equal opportunities in education or labor market. Mulyani is convinced that closing the gender gap 
can help reduce poverty. A lot of studies showing that the gender gap is definitely not only costly personally for a woman, but costly for the economy. If we can reduce the gap, potentially economy can have 12 trillion, which is I think is around 11% of the global GDP. This is not only a problem in Indonesia, but a problem all over the world. So potentially, if you really can create an equal opportunity to be able to participate not only in the domestic but also in the economy, then it is a winning for the family, for that woman, but also for the society. In Indonesia, it's still not common for women to work outside the home. Only around half of all women are employed in paid jobs. The rate has been stalling nearly for two decades. What's holding women in Indonesia back? Similar reason like elsewhere. Once a woman has children, she is expected to do most of the work of raising them. And too many mothers don't really have another choice. How was it for you? You managed both raising children and having a successful career. How did you manage it? <laughs> it was hard. Certainly it's hard. First, I also have a husband just like my father, who is very supportive. He's not intimidated. He's not feel inferior marrying a woman which is maybe perceived as strong. Uh, my own experience when I have my first daughter uh, in the United States and I have to finish my dissertation, but we are running out of money. My husband and my baby that is at that time was one year's daughter. She went back with uh, my husband and I lived uh, alone in the United States to finish my dissertation. So we have like one year apart. That was not an easy uh, time. Uh, the juggling is the most difficult part. And you still also, like any other human being, you are not blessed with 35 hours a day. I mean, you are all only have the same uh, like others 24 hours a day. So yeah, I, I was lucky enough. I'm lucky enough to have that. It's still difficult to change this mindset. That's why Sri Mulyani is encouraging men to take parental leave. Something quite new for Indonesia. More importantly to educate is actually the counterpart, the male part. I think the men and the boys, they need to know that uh, when you talk about gender equality, it's not threatening their position, their role. I usually use this metaphor. If you are going to have a shoes, you don't want the other one is high heel, the other one is like the flat shoes. You are not going to like walk comfortably. You really have to have the same level so that the society can actually walking and pursuing our objective or dream together. Indonesia is reportedly the second most dangerous country for women in the Asia Pacific region. One in three women has reportedly suffered gender-based violence in their lifetime. Sexual violence, street harassment, trafficking and domestic violence are widespread. In some parts of the country there are high rates of child marriage too. And there is still no law in the country protecting girls from female genital mutilation, although it's internationally recognized as a violation of human rights. Almost half of all women in Indonesia have undergone the dangerous practice. All these issues are taboo in society. But I'm sure that with a more uh, education, information and more influencer who can provide uh, understanding on this area, that could be addressed. And all the activists, the NGO is also doing, try to do that address this area. An additional challenge is the growing religious conservatism in the country. Indonesia has the largest Muslim population in the world. Within the Muslim community, traditionalists have made their voices heard and are expanding their influence. They use social media to spread their patriarchal views. I think as a Muslim myself, reading the Quran, I feel like they are giving equal opportunity for men and women. But I also have to admit, some of religious practices who try to then take this kind of fashion or interpretation in a very strict and limited way, which is then being used to then restraining or constraining, especially women in their role in society, or even to have an equal opportunity. And that is uh, quite uh, an example that we see.
And that's why it is still quite a challenge for all of us. Here in Germany, Chancellor Angela Merkel is the first woman to serve in her office. Both of you are trailblazers. I admire her, uh, especially in terms of her leadership, the way that she continue pushing and pursuing a lot of policy, which is important not only for Germany and the German people, but also globally, for example, like climate change. Do you think the next generation of women leaders might have it easier than you did as pioneers? I think for the next uh, leaders, it will not be easier <laughs> uh -huh. because first maybe we think that it's going to be easier because uh, the, the glass ceiling has been broken. But I think for the next generation, they are going to be constantly compared with who break those glass initially. And this is, I mean, like Angela Merkel is just a formidable leader. So the bar is very high because they always like, oh, okay, you actually enjoying the benefit of uh, those, then you should be higher than her. And that is going to be a pressure for any woman leader that is uh, following Angela Merkel. No matter where you are, what your position, always try to put push the boundary, push the boundary, even only one inch, because that is going to give more room for many of girls and women with you or even after you. A strong leader who is using her powerful position to push boundaries for women's interests. Indonesia's finance minister Sri Mulyani is aware of challenges girls and women have to overcome in her conservative country. And she's convinced that gender equality is easier to achieve with men as partners. What is your take on this? How can more men become allies and support women's rights for the benefit of all? Let us know what you think and make sure to watch all the other episodes of our series.